This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. On April 9th, 2017, United Airlines Flight 3411 was about to fly from Chicago to Louisville when flight attendants discovered the plane was overbooked. They tried to get volunteers to give up their seats with promises of travel vouchers and hotel accommodations, but not enough people were willing to get off. United ended up calling some airport security officers. They boarded the plane and forcibly removed a passenger named Dr. David Dow. The officers ripped Dow out of his seat and carried him down the aisle of the airplane, nose bleeding, while horrified onlookers shot video with their phones. You probably remember this incident and the outrage it generated. The international uproar continued over the forced removal of a passenger from a United Airlines flight. Today, the airline's CEO, Oscar Munoz, issued an apology, saying, quote, no one should ever be mistreated this way. I want you to know that we take full responsibility and we will work But why Dr. Dow? How did he end up being the unlucky passenger that United decided to remove? Immediately following the incident, some people thought racial discrimination may have played a part, and it's possible that this played a role in how he was treated. But the answer to how he was chosen was actually an algorithm, a computer program. It crunched through a bunch of data, looking at stuff like how much each passenger had paid for their ticket, what time they checked in, how often they flew on United, and whether they were part of a rewards program. The algorithm likely determined that Dr. Dow was one of the least valuable customers on the flight at the time. Algorithms shape our world in profound and mostly invisible ways. They predict if we'll be valuable customers or whether we're likely to repay a loan. They filter what we see on social media, sort through resumes, and evaluate job performance. They inform prison sentences and monitor our health. Most of these algorithms have been created with good intentions. The goal is to replace subjective judgments with objective measurements. But it doesn't always work out like that. This subject is huge. I think algorithm design may be the big design problem of the 21st century. And that's why I wanted to interview Kathy O'Neill. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much. So can we start, can you give me one of them sort of NPR style uh, introductions and just say your name and what you do? Sure. I'm Kathy O'Neill. I'm a mathematician, data scientist, activist, and author. I wrote the book Weapons of Math Destruction, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. O'Neill studied number theory and then left academia to build predictive algorithms for a hedge fund. But she got really disillusioned by the use of mathematical models in the financial industry. I wanted to like have more impact in the world, but I didn't really know that that impact could be really terrible. I was very naive. After that, O'Neill worked as a data scientist at a couple of startups. And through these experiences, she started to get worried about the influence of poorly designed algorithms. So we'll start with the most obvious question. What is an algorithm? At its most basic, an algorithm is a step-by-step guide to solving a problem. It's a set of instructions, like a recipe. The example I like to give is like cooking dinner for my family. So in this case, the problem is how to make a successful dinner. O'Neill starts with a set of ingredients, and as she's creating the meal, she's constantly making choices about what ingredients are healthy enough to include in her dinner algorithm. I curate that data because those ramen noodle packages <laughs> that my kids like so much, I don't I don't think of those as ingredients, right? So I exclude them. I'm curating, and I'm imp- therefore imposing my agenda on this algorithm. In addition to curating the ingredients, O'Neill, as the cook, also defines what a successful outcome looks like. I'm also defining success, right? I'm in charge of success. I define success to be um, if my kids eat vegetables at that meal. And, you know, a different cook might define success differently. You know, my eight-year-old would define success to be like whether he got to eat Nutella. So that's another way where we, the builders, impose our agenda on the algorithm. O'Neill's main point here is that algorithms aren't really objective, even when they're carried out by computers. This is relevant because the companies that build them like to market them as objective, claiming they remove human error and fallibility from complex decision-making. But every algorithm reflects the priorities and judgments of its human designer. Of course, that doesn't necessarily make algorithms bad. Right. So, I mean, it's very important to me that I don't get the reputation of hating all algorithms. I actually like algorithms, and I think algorithms could really help. But O'Neill does single out a particular kind of algorithm for scrutiny. These are the ones we should worry about. 
And they're characterized by three properties, that they're very widespread and important. So, like, they make important decisions about a lot of people. Number two, that they're secret, that the people don't understand how they're being scored. And number three, that they're destructive. Like, one bad mistake in the in the design, if you will, of these algorithms will actually not only make it unfair for individuals, but sort of categorically unfair for enormous populations as it gets scaled up. O'Neill has a shorthand for these algorithms, the widespread, mysterious, and destructive ones. She calls them weapons of math destruction. To show how one of these destructive algorithms works, O'Neill points to the criminal justice system. For hundreds of years, key decisions in the legal process, like the amount of bail, length of sentence, and likelihood of parole, have been in the hands of fallible human beings guided by their instincts, and sometimes their personal biases. The judges are sort of famously racist, some of them more than others. And that racism can produce very different outcomes for defendants. For example, the ACLU has found that sentences imposed on black men in the federal system are nearly 20% longer than those for white men convicted of similar crimes. And studies have shown that prosecutors are more likely to seek the death penalty for African Americans than for whites convicted of the same charges. So you might think that computerized models fed by data would contribute to more even-handed treatment. The criminal justice system thinks so too. It has increasingly tried to minimize human bias by turning to risk assessment algorithms. Like crime risk, like what is the chance of someone coming back to prison after leaving it? Many of these risk algorithms look at a person's record of arrests and convictions. The problem is that data is already skewed by some social realities. Take, for example, the fact that white people and black people use marijuana at roughly equal rates. And yet... There's five times as many blacks getting arrested for smoking pot as whites. Five times as many. This may be because black neighborhoods tend to be more heavily policed than white neighborhoods, which means black people get arrested for certain crimes more often than white people. Risk algorithms detect these patterns and apply them to the future. So if the past is shaped in part by racism, the future will be too. The larger point is we have terrible data here, but the statisticians involved, the data scientists, are like blithely going forward and pretending that our data is good, and then we're using it to actually make important decisions. Risk assessment algorithms also look at a defendant's answers to a questionnaire that's supposed to tease out certain risk factors. They have questions like, you know, did you grow up in a high crime neighborhood? Are you on welfare? Do you have a mental health problem? Do you have addiction problems? Did your father go to prison? You know, they're basically proxies for race and class, but it's embedded in this scoring system and the judge is given the score and it's called objective. What is what is a judge take away from it or, you know, how is it used? If you have a high risk score, it's used to send you to prison for longer in sentencing. Wow. There's also, it's also used in bail hearings and parole hearings. If you have a high recidivism risk score, you don't get parole. Mm -hmm. And presumably you could take all that biased input data and say, this high chance of recidivism means that we should rehabilitate more. I mean, like you could take that, exactly. all that same stuff and choose to do a completely different thing with the result of the algorithm. To that's exactly my point. Exactly my point. You know, we could say, oh, I wonder why people who have this characteristic have so much worse recidivism. Well, let's try to help them find a job. Maybe that'll help. We could use those algorithms, those risk scores, to try to account for our society. Instead, O'Neill says, in many cases, we're effectively penalizing people for societal and structural issues that they have little control over. And we're doing it at a massive scale, using these new technological tools. We're shifting the blame, if you will, from the society, which is the one that should own these problems, to the individual and punishing them for it. It should be said that, in some cases, algorithms are helping to change elements of the criminal justice system for the better. For example, New Jersey recently did away with their cash bail system, which disadvantaged low-income defendants. They now rely on predictive algorithms instead. Data shows that the state's pre-trial county jail populations are down by about 20%. But still, algorithms like that one remain unaudited and unregulated. And it's a problem when algorithms are basically black boxes. In many cases, they're designed by private companies who sell them to other companies, and the exact details of how they work are kept secret. Not only is the public in the dark, even the companies using these things might not understand exactly how the data is being processed. This is true of many of the problematic algorithms that O'Neill has looked at, whether they're used for sorting loan applications or assessing teacher performance. There's some kind of weird thing that happens to people when mathematical scores are trotted out. They just start 
closing their eyes and believing it because it's math. And they, do, I feel like, oh, I'm not an expert of math, so I can't push back. And that's, that's something you just see time and time again. You're like, why didn't you question this? This doesn't make sense. Oh, well, it's math and I don't understand it. Right now, it seems like because of algorithms and math, it's just a new place to place blame so that you do not have to think about your decisions as an actual company. Um, because these things are just so powerful and so you know mesmerizing to us, especially right now. They can be used in all kinds of nefarious ways. They're almost magical. Is that? Yeah, that's um, uh, scary. <laughs> it's scary, and I think I think I would go like I would go one step further than that. I feel like just by observation that these algorithms they don't show up randomly. They show up when there's a really difficult conversation that people want to avoid. <laughs> oh, they show, they like you know they're like oh we don't know what it what makes a good teacher mm-hmm. and different people have different opinions about that so let's just bypass this conversation by having an algorithm score teachers yeah or we don't know what prison is really for <laughs> <laughs> you know let's have a way of deciding how long to sentence somebody we introduce these silver bullet mathematical algorithms because we don't want to have a conversation In O'Neill's book, she writes about this young guy named Kyle Beam, who takes some time off college to get treated for bipolar disorder. Once he's better and ready to go back to school, he applies for a part-time job at Kroger, which is a big grocery store chain. He has a friend who works there who offers to vouch for him. Kyle was such a good student that he figured the application would be just a formality, but he didn't get called back for an interview. His application was red-lighted by the personality test he'd taken when he applied for the job. The test was part of an employee selection algorithm developed by a private workforce company called Kronos. 70% of job applicants in this country take personality tests before they get an interview. So this is a very common practice. Kyle had that screening and he found out because his friend worked at Kroger's that he had failed the test. So most people never find that out. They just don't hear back. Um, And the other thing that was unusual about Kyle is that his dad is a lawyer. So his dad was like, "What, what were the questions like on this test? And he said, well, there, some of them were a lot like the questions I got at the hospital, the mental health assessment. The test Kyle got at the hospital was called the five-factor model test, and it grades people on extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and openness to new ideas. It's used in mental health evaluations. The potential employee's answers to the test are then plugged into an algorithm that decides whether the person should be hired. So his father was like, whoa, that's illegal under the Americans with Disability Act. So his father and he sort of figured out together that something very fishy had been going on. And his father's actually filed a class action lawsuit against Kroger's for that. The suit is still pending, but arguments are likely to focus on whether the personality test can be considered a medical exam. If it is, it'd be illegal under the ADA. O'Neill gets that different jobs require people with different personality types, but she says a hiring algorithm is a blunt and unregulated tool that ends up disqualifying big categories of people, which makes it a classic weapon of math destruction. In certain jobs, you wouldn't want neurotic people or introverted people. Like if you're at a call center where a lot of really irate customers call you up, that might be a problem. In which case, it is actually legal if you get an exception for your company. The the problem is that these personality tests are not carefully designed for for each business. But rather, what happens is that these companies just sell the same personality test to all the businesses that will buy them. A lot of the algorithms that O'Neill explores in her book are largely hidden. They don't get a lot of attention. We as consumers and job applicants and employees may not even be aware that they're humming along in the background of our lives, sorting us into piles and categories. But there is one kind of algorithm that's gotten a lot of attention in the news lately. Is this a good or bad thing that social media has been able to infiltrate uh, politics? Social media is a technology. And as we know, technologies have their good sides and their dark sides, their not-so-good sides. So it all depends on... Towards the end of our conversation, O'Neill and I started talking about the recent election and the complex ways that social media algorithms shape the news that we receive. Facebook shows us stories and ads based on what they think we want. And of course, what they think we want is based on algorithms. These algorithms look at what we've clicked on before and then feed us more content we like. The result is that 